Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, we don't have too much time. So good afternoon to all of you from Bali. My name is Eva Wojkowska and I'm the co-founder and uh, COO of Copernic and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Please kindly mute yourself during the webinar so we have good sound and it's up to you whether you leave your video camera on or off. So with that out of the way, welcome and thank you for making the time to join us today for this one hour webinar during which we'll be sharing the results of a rapid study we conducted over the past month and a half on the level of usage of generative AI or Gen AI as I'll be referring to it throughout in Indonesia's development sector. So there was a lot of interest uh, in this webinar. We had uh, almost 200 people join and uh, we've got more than 50 online so far, 55, and uh, more people are joining as I speak. So it seems that these days everyone is talking about Gen AI or its applications such as ChatGPT. And at Copernic, we've started to use it in our daily work and have been following the often very heated discussions about its benefits and also the potential risks associated with it. And so we wanted to understand how others were using Gen AI in their work in the development sector in Indonesia and what they were thinking about it, what were their experiences with it, what are the interesting use cases. So today we're really happy to share with you a summary of the results of our rapid study about the use of Gen AI in Indonesia's development sector. Now, this is a very rapidly evolving field. Therefore, it really is just a pulse check of a particular point in time. And it's going to change very quickly. But nonetheless, uh, we hope that you will find the results interesting and find some of the use cases uh, interesting or perhaps relevant to your work. I'm joined today by four panelists. I've got Toshi Nakamura, who is the CEO and the other co-founder of Copernic. We have uh, Quareza Kualdi, or Aldi, who is an analyst at Copernic and was very involved in the report. We have Aisha Marzuki, who is the head of exploration at UNDP Indonesia, and Tunga Dewi, who is the co-founder and CEO of Perfect Fit, an emerging social enterprise. So we're going to begin with a 20, 25 minute presentation by Toshi and Aldi, who will present the findings from the Gen AI survey that was conducted last month in May. And please ask any questions that you have during the presentation by typing them in the chat box. And please also identify yourself and your organization when you ask the question. We'll be addressing the questions after the presentation and the panel discussion. So over to you, Toshi. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and a good afternoon to those who are in the time zone. Um, as Eva said, uh, this is a really taking the pulse of the usage of the generative AI in the Indonesia's development sector. It's, so it's quite um, focused, uh, but I hope these uh, findings will be uh, interesting and useful for all of us. So um, <clears throat> just uh, as a disclaimer, um, we are talking about Gen AI, which is a branch of artificial intelligence, right? So we are not talking about the AI as a whole. So if you think about the uh, Gen AI, which is um, smaller than the machine learning uh, or deep learning, and then Gen AI is really about uh, generating new, new content uh, based on new uh, deep learning. And then often you give prompt and then you get uh, the, the output. And maybe it's easier if we think about specific applications uh, such as ChatGPT or BARD, um, which is uh, mainly a text-based um, Gen AI. And there are also image-based Gen AI, such as DALI or Midjourney, and then others uh, such as code or video. And there are also um, other types of uh, Gen AI. Now, having um, defined the scope of uh, our Gen AI, I am going to hand over to my colleague Aldi, to share the key findings of the survey. Thank you, Toshi. Hi, everyone. 
how I will share our survey study that we conducted last month in May. So we sent out our survey to approximately 2,000 individuals who work for development sector institutions such as NGO, social enterprises, research institution, and agency. So out of those 2,000 surveys that we sent out, we got response from 121 respondents. As you can see from the board chart, from the chart, the majority of our respondents came from NGO and social enterprise, which consists of 72% uh, of our total sample. So first, we asked our respondents regarding how familiar are they with the generative AI. So as you can see from the bar chart, uh, on the very left-hand side is the overall of all respondents, and next to it, until the very right, is the respondent response based on the respective type of organization. So overall, 13% of respondents reported that their organization is very familiar with generative AI, while 46% indicated having a basic awareness of it. One interesting result is that for aid agency itself, well, there is a significant 67% who still do not have familiarity with Gen AI. Okay. Then we ask our respondents how often that they use Gen AI. Overall, 36% of the respondents said that they are using Gen AI daily or quite frequently. However, again, constant with the previous finding, for aid agency, there are none that, is, that use Gen AI daily nor frequent. They only use it for rare occasions. So we continue to our, uh, we continue by asking our respondent for what purpose that they use generative AI for. So in overall, the most common application revolve around research and idea generations with 35% of overall respondents as well as for content creation and copy editing, followed by translation and also programming. Next, we asked our respondents what kind of generative AI tools out there that they use. So in overall, ChatGPT is the most widely used platform across all types of organization. Now, before we continue, I would like to ask everyone who has used generative AI before to join in in our short poll. So right now, you should see a poll pop up on your screen uh, that asks which generative AI tools that have you used before. So I will give you 30 seconds to fill out the poll. Yes, so I think it's con consistent, right, with our uh, finding as well that ChatGPT with 94% is the most used uh, Gen AI application. Great, thank you everyone for joining in our short poll. Perfect, now let's continue. Okay, now, so next we ask our respondents about their future outlook for Gen AI. And based on our result, 67 of all respondents said that they have a positive outlook on the future of generative AI. Lastly, despite the positive outlook mentioned before, however, when we ask about, uh, uh, when we ask our respondents, do they have any concern on the use of Gen AI? Still, there are 47% of respondents express their concern about the potential negative impact of the generative AI usage. So most of the respondents noted the over dependence on Gen AI for work, where it has potential to limit the growth and development of human skill and ability. And furthermore, the respondent also mentioned about job displacement, where Gen AI can result in job losses for some industry, and also the lack of data reliability that generated by Gen AI, such as ChatGPT, for instance. Yes, that is the overall of our survey result. Subsequently, we also conducted an interview with some of our respondents to get much deeper insights on the use cases of generative AI in the development sector. Toshi will explain more about that. So over to you, Toshi. Thank you, Aldi. So there are, as Aldi said, that uh, out of the survey respondents, we noticed that uh, some people are uh, using the Gen AI very creatively. And so we had the opportunity to have uh, more in-depth interviews and uh, we were able to collect um, and document 10 notable use cases in the report, uh, which is categorized with the two um, axes. One is the type of Gen AI. So is it uh, mainly text-based 
image-based or code-based. Another uh, axis that we used was the required proficiency level. So some of the usage seems to be more advanced, while others look more basic. And then I think given that uh, really um, at this point in the development sector, people have a very different level of proficiency. And um, so it will be good to cover a different level and then different types of usage in the report. And you will see that uh, there will be 10 cases and the majority are text-based. And then there are some examples of image-based and the code-based use cases. Now, um, the uh, full report will cover the, all the 10 cases, but uh, for this webinar, uh, we are only going to look at uh, four out of the, the 10, uh, given the time uh, limitations that we have. Now, uh, let's look at this uh, first example, this uh, promotional campaign uh, text development. So the, the objective of this usage was to help micro businesses to create promotional messages um, for the Lebaran campaign. Um, so the Gen AI app used was a chat GPT and then prompt use was in Bahasa Indonesia, uh, generate promotional captions for Instagram to inform about the discounts for hijab during the Baran. And with this uh, prompt, the uh, chat GPT was able to generate this uh, much uh, information and uh, now what happened was that uh, the uh, micro businesses owner then uh, looked at this as a draft and then sometimes adjusted the text based on their specific needs or uh, some of them uh, provided additional prompt so that uh, they had more uh, tailored campaign messages. Um, so this was uh, a first example uh, for text-based and then for the promotional campaign. A second example that uh, I'm going to share is around the image. So um, as you might have uh, seen and you might remember at the very beginning of this uh, slide, uh, we had the, uh, the, the animation image. Uh, we actually generated using the Adobe Firefly and uh, the caption that a prompt that we provided was to generate an illustration for people conducting analysis on AI usage in the development sector in Indonesia. So this is for this report. And uh, the uh, Adobe generated this image. Now the, the overall color scheme that uh, Adobe Firefly generated initially was uh, not uh, what we were looking for. Uh, so the, our designer manually adjusted the, the color scheme, but the overall design is, uh, is coming out of this uh, Gen AI Adobe Firefly. So this is a second use case example. Now moving on to the third one, this is an interesting uh, uh, troubleshooting. So um, uh, social enterprise, uh, had the uh, error on their website when the organization's IT engineer was not available. And um, so uh, the, their website was uh, based on the web flow. Um, there's a software to, to build a website. Now, initially they gave uh, information about how their website was developed uh, or built on. Uh, they provided that it is on the web flow and then what kind of error they were seeing on their website and then asked the chat GPT to provide a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, instructions on how to fix this error. And uh, it uh, did generate a very easy to follow uh, instructions. And then some of the steps uh, when they were not sure about they actually asked additional questions uh, through prompt so that uh, ChatGPT can further elaborate the specific of the steps that uh, the user need to take. 
So that is the third use case um, around the uh, website troubleshooting. Now, the last case that uh, I'm sharing today uh, is around the statistical analysis and the data visualization. So there was a, a raw data in the Excel format, and uh, this was uh, used with, uh, along with ChatGPT and RStudio. And the prompt was uh, something like generate R code to visualize this data uh, set with a scatter plot, and then pasted the raw original uh, Excel data. Um, those who, you, uh, who do not know RStudio, this, this is an open source statistical uh, analysis software, um, which is often used when a large data set is uh, a need to be analyzed. Um, so the output that this uh, chat GPT generated was the code that uh, you need to uh, uh, generate for the R. And this uh, code was uh, simply copy pasted into the R studio. And then rather than actually the user typing this code uh, him or herself, uh, it was generated automatically, and then this scatter plot was created. Now, this uh, uh, was uh, further improved. Uh, additional prompt was provided to make it uh, more interactive. And uh, so the, uh, there was additional kind of uh, process that followed this initial um, data visualization. So, um, I shared four out of the 10 uh, use cases that is in the report, uh, but the, at the end of this webinar, we will share the link to the full report so that uh, those who are interested can uh, take a look at the, the other examples as well. Now, um, I want to switch gear uh, to talk about the potential risks. Um, we know that uh, there are a lot of talks about the biases, um, the language-wise, cultural-wise, or gender-wise. Um, but uh, here, I want to uh, focus on the digital divide. So uh, we have been talking about digital divide since the beginning of the internet. And uh, in the case of Indonesia, in the last 20 years, the digital divide as uh, defined as access to internet, hasn't really improved. There has always been a, a gap between the urban and rural uh, internet connectivity. It's around 20% or so. Uh, but uh, what does it mean uh, when this Gen AI comes to the picture? So let's think about the prerequisite, right? To benefit from the generative AI. The first prerequisite, prerequisite is obviously access to electricity. Without that, you do not have uh, internet. Or, so how is the status, current situation in Indonesia now? Now, according to the government statistics, over 99% of Indonesia has been electrified. So this seems to be good. Uh, this is thick. Although uh, those who are working in the sector know that uh, this electrification doesn't mean the full electrification. Sometimes villages uh, have a power cut um, uh, for a few hours a day. But the second prerequisite to really benefit from the Gen AI is access to internet. Um, so at the moment, urban populations, 88, over 88% 88 of the urban populations do have access to internet and rural population much less. But this shows that there's still a significant proportion of Indonesians do not have access to internet. So um, now the next thing that uh, you need is access to some kind of device. The smartphone ownership in Indonesia is still not very high, especially in the rural area. So there's a, a, a definitely a gap between the rural and urban population's ownership to smartphone. Um, but even the, in, the, in the urban area, 
um, close to 28% uh, of the population do not have access to smartphones. So there's still a significant gap. Now, another prerequisite is a basic digital literacy. So still the urban and rural area uh, population, around half are considered to be low in the digital literacy. So this is up to kind of a basic usage of internet, right? So in order to use and benefit from the, let's say a search engine, uh, you need all these four. But for the Gen AI, you need, in addition to this, a Gen AI literacy, right? Um, so that's kind of probably uh, better uh, expressed in the prompt proficiency. And there's a lot of talk about the prompt engineering which indicates that this is kind of becoming a specialized field, uh, which means that you need a certain level of a Gen AI literacy. So combined all these gaps from access to internet, access to device, access to basic digital literacy and the Gen AI literacy, I think there is a significant risk that uh, uh, those uh, dis disadvantaged group will be further left behind in the digital divide if this grows only organically. Now, looking at the, uh, the overall report, um, we have seen that uh, the respondents, uh, some of them have already begun using uh, various and different types of Gen AI applications. And then there are uh, several innovative and interesting use cases emerging and uh, they are using a text code and image-based Gen AI really to make the, the, the work more efficient uh, and faster. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be mindful of the uh, biases and also potential of widening of the digital divide uh, because of the reason that I just uh, described. Um, so as a development sector, uh, I think uh, there's an opportunity to bridge this uh, possible uh, widening digital divide, which is through delivering a tailored training program for the disadvantaged communities to better understand and engage with the Gen AI. And uh, hopefully this will lead to a more equitable utilization of this technology in Indonesia. So, um, as I said, uh, the full report, uh, uh, we only shared half of the content of the full, full report. And then at the end of this uh, webinar, we will share a hyperlink to the report, both in English and in Bahasa, Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Toshi, and thank you, Aldi, for the presentation of the summary of the report. And uh, as you just mentioned, uh, we will be sharing the, the link to the report at the end of this webinar and later uh, the recording and the report via email to all those who participated in the webinar. So now I would like to open up the panel discussion and invite Aisha Marsuki of UNDP and Tunga Dewi of Perfect Fit to join us on the screen. And a reminder to all participants to please ask uh, any questions you have in the chat box anytime. There are no stupid questions. Uh, we're all uh, we're all learning uh, as we we're making the the path by walking as we figure all this out, and we'll be answering the questions after this uh, discussion with the panelists. So first of all, um, Aisha, I'd like. I'd like to ask Aisha and Tunga to reflect on the results of the survey and of the rapid pulse check of the use of Gen I in the development sector. What are your reactions? Any surprises? Uh, Aisha, why don't we start with you? Great. Thank you so much, Emma, for the question and Toshi and Aldi for the presentation. It was interesting to see the focus on uh, Gen AI application in the Indonesia's development sector, as we've seen the majority of the discourse uh, is still within the broader global scope. So it was eye-opening to see what are the perception of different stakeholders in the development sector within Indonesia, and more importantly, how can we tailor that to the global South uh, context? 
And it's interesting to see that while majority of the respondents are aware and have been using uh, Gen AI for daily usage, there's still a lot of room for um, building one's own capacity, right, to leverage the Gen AI application. So I think that last point of prompt engineering is something that is emerging uh, uh, globally, that people are treating uh, this as a particular skill, as an important skill, perhaps, in the next five, 10 years, that we need to equip ourselves to better generate uh, content through learning about prompts, but also to be able to identify where that is visible in our work that could hinder uh, uh, authenticity, originality, and so on. I, I think I'll stop there and I'm back to you, Ewa. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, and what about you, Tunga? What What are your reflections on the on the report and the findings? Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, very nice to virtually connect with you. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm Tunga, co-founder and CEO of Perfect Fit. We are a social enterprise uh, based in Bali, working uh, to transform menstrual health in Indonesia. Uh, personally, I've been really excited uh, reading this report and having generative AI to uh, influence our daily life uh, in general. Because AI itself as a as a technology, it's been there since uh, 1965, but it's still very limited to those like nerds that's in the engineering or research uh, in like a computer uh, school. Uh, and so like having it now not only monopolized by uh, big companies in Silicon Valley, but also like uh, us in development sector to use it uh, in almost everyday basis uh, as the finding also show. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm really excited and see like the, the big potential uh, benefits of it as I uh, use by myself that it has increased my efficiency, my productivity and uh, enhanced more innovation within uh, my uh, company. Uh, I do really believe the, the challenge and the potential threat with the Indonesia uh, has limited infrastructure. Uh, it, it can create more uh, like uh, inequality, I would say. Uh, so less uh, social equity as the uh, electricity, internet device, literacy and, and prob. So uh, I agree that uh, as development sector, it should be in our pipeline to work towards that. Uh, so uh, Copernic and many uh, development organizations has put training to help micro small enterprise with Facebook advertisement and e-commerce. So maybe we need to add chat GPT and generative AI as one of the curriculum, I would say, to reduce the, the inequality. And then another thing that I was thinking that uh, uh, it's also can uh, can do more is uh, development sector like nonprofit, uh, especially like research institute should work alongside the government to increase the privacy and uh, like potential uh, threats uh, towards the, the, the regulation. So two things like uh, giving training to reduce inequality because I have my own experience also with our staff in Labuan Bajo and Flores. It's very hard for them to use that because I've already uh, told about it. Uh, whereas like my staff in Bali is, uh, doesn't have any problem. Uh, so there's a big gap to fulfill that. Uh, but also in terms of advocacy uh, and the regulation, we need to work alongside government and private to make sure that it's safe uh, and 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 uh, give privacy to to the people who use it. So that's my reflection. Thank you. Thanks, Tunga. Um, so training, advocacy, and a big focus on uh, on privacy. Um, 
I'm going to jump back to you, Aisha, uh, and I'd love to hear your personal experience of how you've used um, Gen AI applications in your work, in your daily work. If you could share uh, one or two examples of what that looked like and how useful it was or perhaps wasn't. Great. Uh, thank you. So um, I do believe that uh, a lot of the usage uh, of generative AI is um, influenced by our modes of thinking, our ways of seeing the world, and ability to see what's not out there as well. And Gen AI is the vehicle that would let us you know, envision um, futures that could be uh, both in a utopian vision, but also perhaps not so utopian, right? And I'm uh, my personal background is a designer or arch architect by training, so that's why it drew me more towards the visual um, aspect of Gen AI. Uh, thank you for showcasing this example. So I've used the DAL E uh, um, by OpenAI as a platform to generate or to ideate what potential future visions are there uh, for cities that are being developed by the government of Indonesia. Um, we had the opportunity in UNDP to support the government in enhancing their policies and programmatic intervention through innovative approaches. That is one of the focus here at uh, UNDP Accelerate Lab uh, um, is prioritizing. What can we try with new tools, new, new methods, and how can we think differently about how we design policies, how we design programs, how do we include people and uh, citizens in the process? And for this particular case study, we analyze existing policies and academic journals on a thematic uh, area that was agreed upon with the government. And from this initial analysis, we identified several gaps and opportunities in which we saw that while the focus of many city development revolves around the high tech aspect, the smart city, the um, integrated transportation and so on, there is an opportunity to embed that vision and enhance it with principles of inclusion, focusing on leaving no one behind. And that is what the focus for from UNDP support is, that how can we strengthen the established policies and programs with principles to ensure that we are providing equitable services to citizens and those that are disadvantaged could be included in the process uh, that the transition is just and they would be empowered at the end of the day. So, uh, but with this key insights that we identified from the research, uh, we try to visualize what features are there because even though a lot of the plans from the government already has a specific vision, uh, we try to experiment with what would it look like if we had embedded or integrated elements of principles, i.e. using prompts like universal design for public spaces or smart city with green areas that is pedestrian friendly or that is uh, you know el elderly friendly, things like that. So we experimented with a lot of prompts and the result was multiple uh, images uh, generated beyond our expectation. We didn't know what we were expecting uh, uh, when we tried this experiment, but what the result was, it aided the team to reflect personally on the project. We then discuss uh, for internal purposes, the different routes or pathways that the project would take. You know, initially we were embedding uh, principles of inclusion within city planning, but then it took us a couple of steps further. Hey, we haven't think about A or B or C that was uh, not necessarily identified, but that was visualized through this uh, content. So in addition to personal reflections, we also identified potential areas for intervention or for support. 
uh, for the government partner. Building upon this experience, we saw that there is ample opportunity uh, and we're currently exploring uh, what are the value of customized platforms uh, for the organization to further ensure participatory process for urban planning. So how do we bring diverse set of participants using a universal medium in which this case is visual? How do we ensure that uh, we are able to integrate what the national development agenda is from the government? Uh, combining that with collective imagination from local communities. Uh, back to you, Ewa. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that example, Aisha. Um, it's a very, very interesting and, and visual um, visual example. So thank you. And uh, Tonga, you mentioned in your um, brief uh answer previously that you had been uh, using Gen AI uh, applications in your work and in the running of your business. Can you tell us a little bit about so, some examples of, of how, how you've used it for the business processes of running, running a business, running a company? Thanks, Eva. So short question, uh, short answer, nothing advanced like coding, but definitely really <laughs> helpful in, in perform, like helping me to do my work. So, so, so perfect fit it's, uh, itself is a, is a lean team. So we are seven people, uh, including me. So we work, uh, we, we, we wear multiple hats, uh, and uh, me, myself, like my core role in the business is to do fundraising, business development, financial analysis, uh, and become the external face of the company. So in terms of uh, using generative AI, it mostly helped to do all of my work. So for fundraising, it helped to to do um, uh, create like help me to create my business plan. Uh, like like I just write an outline about it, and I ask to like um, like refine it. And if there's something missing, you know, just play around with the 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 prompt uh, and have uh, have the technology as my brainstorming buddy. Uh, and, uh, for business development, it's really helped me to write like proposal writing. Uh, so, uh, we participated in two accelerator, uh, uh, last year. Uh, and like, usually I took like one or two weeks to create, like, uh, to submit proposals and be, with chat GPT, it has, has helped me to cut it into one or two days to finally submit it. Uh, I know it's it's very, I think for, for me personally, it's very, very helpful to improve like efficiency and, and productivity. I can definitely relate uh, to that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for finance and accounting, as uh, you mentioned before in the uh, in the slide, like I just asked like stupid questions. For example, I bought a new laptop uh, for my staff and what should I put in the... Uh, finance uh, accounting so I do have my my admin persons but I like to uh, to do the analysis every month and then it helped me to like oh these are the things and uh, you can put it here uh, or here or here the things you can't find it on Google or other search engine but it will like save one or two hours of your like finding credible information uh, for this uh, but uh, the next uh, slide would be like the uh, also for the fundraising, like, for example, like uh, I had a, yeah, a talk with investor before and I want to, uh, they ask these questions and I just like quickly ask like, what's the uh, success fee for, for fundraising, etc. So, and the, the result of the, the meeting was uh, like, she was really happy with, with us. So, so far, it's it's been really really helpful uh, for for me personally. Uh, other than like creating content, writing proposal, and also like write my slides and even script for my demo day, uh, I also like use uh, like Aisha did like uh, Doll E, even like uh, Canva and Notion. Uh, the software that uh, like the that we use also have generative AI embedded inside. So you can also write a prompt in Canva to create like slides and background and then also uh, 
there there is a new one uh, called photo room that can also help for your marketing so i think there are now a lot we we ha just have to try and keep up with the innovations uh, and also consider the, the limitations Great. Thank you so much, Tunga. Um, and thank you uh, for the questions that are coming in from the audience. We'll be addressing those in a moment. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask Toshi, what are your thoughts uh, about the examples of the use cases that are that were just shared by Aisha and, and Tunga? Yeah, I think it's it's really, really great. And then I think that the, the more people use it, the more use cases emerge. And uh, learning from the peer organizations and peer institutions are really a useful way to, to really, you know, uh, develop this sector together. Um, so um, hopefully, um, you know, we can uh, consolidate those use case information and uh, the more organization can uh, benefit from uh, and learn from each other. Great, thank you. So just one more question from me before I jump into the audience questions. Uh, I wanted to ask each of you uh, in the following order, Aisha Tunga Toshi, uh, what are the things to watch out for? What are the risks beyond what's um, already been highlighted? Aisha? Uh, thank you, Ewa. Yeah, majority of my personal concern is still related to the um, biases again that is perpetuated uh which the the report already covered uh briefly uh in the presentation uh, but also about the potential detrimental use of uh, gen ai i really um resonate again also with Tunga's um example where we can shorten the um legwork or the period that we need usually to um the develop outputs, right, uh, uh, crucially. And then we can focus more on the substantive work and also use uh, Gen AI to check, for instance, for uh, grammatical error and things like that to ensure that uh, we are conveying what we uh, need to. But the other side, I guess, of that is it could potentially also enhance the uh, opportunity for detrimental use of Gen AI. Um, we could easily, you know, uh, ask the uh, platforms to code um, for programs or websites that are uh, detrimental in the sense that it could increase criminal criminalization uh, percentage or fraud or things like that. So while you know we're seeing this uh, in an opportunistic and positive light on the potential uh, benefits that we could uh, leverage from it, there's always that side where people could use it for no good. Um, and more importantly, in the development sector, uh, I feel like we, all of us, you know, uh, together in this while we're learning, as you said, need to safeguard the ethics, the digital hygiene of how we use this to not further, uh, for instance, uh, not uh, entrench on human rights and other uh, issues like that. Thank you so much, uh, Aisha. And what about you, Tunga? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Aisha. So th three things from me uh, to watch out. The first one is uh, the report uh, briefly uh, mentioned uh, the offer dependence. It can create intellectual laziness of, of in the, an individual because uh, we've been so, let's say, over dependence, everything, us, everything of, uh, in AI, and we lose our critical thinking to know like which one that's right, which one is uh, not. And then we uh, like, we really, uh, like doesn't have any limitation of knowledge, but don't know how to uh, how to implement that in social skills or something like that. And I see that can be a threat, let's say in schools that like teachers already uh, afraid that the students can now like write 500 words paper or essay in <laughs> one hour, or so, uh, even less than that. So the, the intellectual laziness among like students or scholars or other other uh, uh, 
researcher can be things to watch out uh, so that we are not really over dependence on AI, uh, gen AI and uh, and can also like uh, still have our critical thinking. Uh, the second then uh, one uh, is also mentioned in the uh, report uh, about uh, greater inequality uh, because of uh, the majority of population is in uh, still in the developing countries. And uh, recently, I listened to one podcast from Gita Wirjawan that uh, with one AI expert in California said that you know the people who has access to AI they can become a neo colonialist meaning this technology is so powerful they can do many things uh with this and then for people who left behind they 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 do nothing like they it's it's very hard to to uh like to uh fulfill of or and and then also uh uh know what's like has been uh going on let's say in a in a develop the uh like the tech uh developed countries so uh those uh the the inequality thing i think we really need to to work on it and and that's why i really i am really excited of like having development sectors to tackle those through training and advocacy uh, and the third is uh, not generative AI in general, but like uh, the the AI and the artificial general uh, intelligence, the AGI, can potentially take off a job. Uh, and uh, if it's if it's like the worst case, take over many like you know uh, human capabilities. Uh, uh, therefore, I think with the Chat GPT four uh that was just released and then two weeks after like 1000 scientists and researcher including like harari steve wozniak elon musk uh sign a letter actually to ai pull uh, like uh ai lab in the us uh to slow down the with the ai and advancement because this new technology is very very powerful uh it can uh potentially like cut out the job so we we really need to like you know we don't left behind we we use it and we like you know uh learn about it uh but also uh we need to take things slow and then have like the government and other stakeholders to uh, put like proper uh security in place so that's hard for me thank you great thanks thanks so much uh tonga for for these really interesting insights um i'm given the time i'm going to skip you toshi and uh but i will uh i will ask this question to you and uh, then ask uh, perhaps Aisha to um, to elaborate further if she has any additional thoughts. So the first question is from Tika from Sekolamu. Uh, what kind of jobs would be gone in, say, 2030? What future competencies should be taught in schools in response to the rise of Gen AI? Toshi, you want to grab that one first? Yeah, I mean, so let me just first of all say that I don't even pretend to be an expert in AI. We are really just to trying to understand how many people are using in what way. And uh, rather than thinking or, you know, thinking deeper into that, uh, the AI's uh, implications as yet. But uh, what uh, one of the article uh, I read was quite interesting. The people will not be, so this article, this person said that um, people will not be replaced by technology, The people will be replaced by people using technology. And uh, I think that's quite telling. And uh, this implication is that uh, we will need to really help people who are not in a position to utilize, uh, to be able to use so that uh, they will not be easily replaced by people using the technology more proficiently. And so I think there's an important role to play here for us. Great, thanks. Um, Aisha, I'm going to um, ask you to respond to that question. Thanks, Tika, by the way, for the question, uh, as well as the next one from uh, Peter Coleman of Aegis. Um, sorry, 
and apologies in advance if I mispronounce anything. Uh, the question is, um, ChatGPT 3, 3.5 is quite limited. It is anticipated that the, is it anticipated the sector will have access to version 4.0 or higher in time, even though the cost may prevent some potential uh, users? So Aisha, do you have any insights from the international organizational development perspective? Sure. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the question. I'll briefly uh, address that one because it's a short answer. We are still in a place where there is no sufficient information to have an outlook on this uh, accessibility point, because even within UNDP, uh, the it seems that the trends are more focused towards uh, ethics, uh, safeguarding risks and concerns around generative AI, uh, as opposed to um, focusing more towards the accessibility itself. Uh, but I, I do agree that uh, exclusivity in terms of cost or other means of ex uh, uh, yeah, accessibility would be a key consideration moving forward. And there is a lot of uh, case studies within UNDP globally of using uh, available platforms, but also um, some uh, country offices globally are working with uh, think tanks and universities to develop a customized platforms that would uh, enable uh, um, aid agencies to retain uh, the privacy of their data. So that's one of the things that could be a potential um, areas to look out for, right? For the use in development sector uh, concerning data that might be confidential. We internally, we've seen a uh, vast uh, opportunity for uh, generative AI platforms to analyze and to make sense of the hefty um, bureaucracy uh, and documents we have internally, which is huge, right? Uh, UNDP in uh, multiple countries uh, working simultaneously. So that's my brief answer uh, uh, for Peter. Thank you for the question. And for uh, the first one on um, skills that are necessary for, you know, students. Um, this has been interesting because initially when uh, generative AI first uh, land, you know, we thought that it would instantly replace um, writers and, and medical analysis and anything that requires the left brain uh, for that analytical analysis and problem solving. But what we're seeing that is gaining pace also is the replacement of creative thinking and innovation and those that require a bigger uh, uh, bigger uh, ability to make sense of things and to solve puzzles for the right brain, uh, which is one of the, the, not necessarily backlash, but one of the concerns were from global citizens that now not only the analytical thinking that is being, uh, that is presently uh, being replaced by generative AI, but also those uh, jobs that requires uh, uh, the right brain to, to think creatively. So uh, echoing what Tunga mentioned on critical thinking, I do believe that moving forward, it's crucial for students and uh, young people in general to equip themselves with the ability to look ahead to think differently and to have that vision and using Gen AI as a vehicle to reach that vision. So how do we think uh, authentically? How do we generate uh, original enough ideas with the support uh, of Gen AI to refine it, to, uh, to perfect it, to consult quote unquote with it on potential flaws and areas for uh, development. So really trying to stay ahead of the curve by uh, you know, uh, having a bigger understanding of how things work globally, uh, being able to send certain things, pick up trends, and and those subtle uh, soft skills that would be crucial for students, uh, I believe, uh, in the next five, 10 years, while we see the rapid developments of Gen AI. Thanks, Aisha. Um, Toshi, do you have anything to add to... Uh, Aisha's response regarding uh, Peter's question. And let me just ask you another question that's that's come in, which is 
What are your thoughts on from Javita? Thank you, Javita. What are your thoughts on preventing the perpetuation of echo chambers or hive minds with the use of Gen AI? I know Gen AI. I know that it's uh, something that you looked at uh, in the in the research, and I, I think it would be interesting to to discuss here. Yeah, I think the cost is really a, a big challenge. Um, the accessibility of this kind of platform. And then I just think about the analogy with, let's say, the Microsoft Office, right? The, which is not cheap. Um, so Excel, Word, and PowerPoint, et cetera, not cheap. But the, there's a, this initiative uh, led by the TechSoup. Um, so they are basically uh, making those tools available at a much, much cheaper price for nonprofit organizations so that they can um, use that without paying the, the, the huge bucks. And then also, I think we've also seen that the different competing products, um, the Google's products, which are free, although they are taking information. Um, but uh, so I think the alternatives and also this kind of uh, intermediary platforms to give a discount uh, to the most uh, more marginalized communities would be something that uh, we need to uh, look forward to. And the echo chamber, I think that uh, is a critical uh, point. Um, there was a discussion during uh, one of the interviews um, uh, out of the survey that the uh, donor uh, may find it difficult to distinguish different types of proposals coming from the NGOs. Uh, if they basically ask the chat GPT to develop a proposal to increase, let's say, access to, to water in the rural area, maybe the answer will be very similar and then the, therefore the proposal will be very similar. But I think the one of the way that uh, was also discussed in the, in, the, in the interview was to the way that the, um, let's say the donors evaluate those proposals need to be different rather than simply reading the text. This should be a conversation or interviews uh, so that uh, there's actually a lot of think, thinking behind those texts. And then there's, uh, these are probably the things that uh, differentiate uh, one organization from the other. Great. Thank you, uh, Toshi, Aisha, Tonga, and Aldi. Um, we have now reached the end of the webinar. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to respond to all the questions that came in today. Excellent questions. Thank you. Um, hopefully you will find some uh, some of the answers in the report, which we the link to which we are sharing right now in the chat box. And we will also be sharing the webinar recording and report link via email to all those who uh, registered and participated. So thank you again uh, for taking the time to join us. I know there are lots of webinars out there. Uh, we hope that you found it useful. Thank you to our awesome panelists and have a great day and see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone.